<clears throat> Welcome to our Bible study today. <clears throat> it's on the, the book of Obadiah. <clears throat> Obadiah was a prophet that was very influential at the time of the fall of Israel and Judah and the difficulties that they exper experienced. And he was trying to give hope to those individuals and to cast and to show God's uh, curse upon the nations that went against Israel. So let me give you an illustration. I used to live in Brandenburg. I was pastor of First Baptist Church there for a while. And a tornado came through there. I wasn't there yet, but I heard a lot of stories about it. And one guy told me that the police and et cetera and different security forces were keeping people from coming around there. And the reason was because they would loot and, and take things away that were there. In other words, they were going to come down like vultures and um, you know try to make a profit on other people's uh, uh, problems and difficulties and bad situation. And so this uh, guy told me that he was out there in his yard and the, his kid's baseball glove was there and some strange guy walked up and picked it up and the, the guy said, that's my son's baseball glove. And the guy just turned around to walk away with it. And he ran over and grabbed him and said, that's my son's baseball glove. But the guy was just going to steal it because he found the opportunity in which to do it. And he's going to kick somebody who's already down. And that's what's going on in today's lesson. That Obadiah is going to talk and to point toward the Edomites because of the way they treated Israel when they were down. So let's uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for guiding us in our study today, and we pray that your spirit would move us and help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, <clears throat> so let me just uh, read the first verses here, and then we'll put it in a historical context, kind of give us some ideas on what we're dealing with. Uh, this is Obadiah uh, verses 1 through 4, and it says, uh, The vision of Obadiah, this is what the Lord God has said about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy has been sent among the nations. Rise up and let's go to war against her. Look, I will make you insignificant among the nations. You will be deeply despised. Your arrogant heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock in your home on the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there, I will bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. Okay, so the the setting here, uh, Obadiah, we don't know exactly when he preached uh, and when he proclaimed. We have an idea, and we think it was after the fall of uh, Israel and right before Judah fell. The Babylonians had come in. The Assyrians came in earlier and took all the people in Israel, the northern kingdoms, as hostage and took over their country. And now, a um, uh, hundred years later or so, the uh, Babylonians had defeated the Assyrians, and now they were coming down, and they were going to take Judah, uh, the last two kingdoms, uh, the tribes that were left, and take them hostage. Uh, and so, uh, and 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 um, during the time of Israel's destruction, the Edomites just looked down and they laughed and they scoffed and they said, "Good, we're glad this is happening." Those are some feelings that we get. You know, you've had an enemy before where something bad happened to him and you just, uh, you know, are, are kind of gleeful and joyful that that happened to him because they mistreated you and they're getting their, what do we call it, come up and says, and so they're getting what they deserve. Now, Obadiah is addressing this very issue. He's saying that we shouldn't be like that. We shouldn't gloat over people who fall. And the Edomites were special enemies of Israel. The Edomites, they were people who were descendants of Esau, and the Israelites were descendants of Jacob. Remember, um, Abraham was afraid he wasn't going to have any kids, and so he took the uh, servant, Hagar, and they had a child, and this child's name was Esau. And Then he did actually, then Rebecca or Sarah did become pregnant and had uh, their son, who was Jacob. Jacob became the founder of Israel, as we know it, and Esau was the founder of the Edomites. They lived north of Israel. They lived up in the mountains, etc., and they were in impregnable uh, surroundings to where they could, you know, pretty much hole up and nobody could get to them. And because of this 
particular position. They thought that nobody could really touch them. They could do almost anything that they wanted to. And so because they were enemies of the Israelites, which today is the same situation, the Arabs and people of that na of those nations in that area and the Israelites, the Jews who are who who remain there, uh, never have gotten along, you know, in these thousands of years. And so we see here that Obadiah is telling the people, he's saying to them that you, he's actually talking to Edomites. So God didn't just talk to Israel. He talked to other countries too. And through Obadiah, he said that you people, because you clothed me, because you made fun of my people, you're going to pay the price. And and he said, um, rise up and let's go to war against her. This, this is what the uh, Edomites said to Israel about Israel. Look, I will make you insubmit. And, and because they did this, so let me say that Edom did actually join forces with other nations and go against Israel at one time. And they fought fought her. They had battles more than once. So they were enemies. And, got, and Obadiah is saying that God said that, you know, you people come basically from the same stock and you should love one another and you should take care of one another and protect one another. But even though you don't, you should still not kick your enemy when they're down. And he says, uh, as an example, you did this. You you looked at Israel and you said, look, Israel's gone to war. They, they've lost the battle. So we're going to go through the gates and we're going to pillage and plunder and take whatever we can. We're going to gloat at the circumstances that Israel found themselves in. And because of that, verse 2, <clears throat> Obadiah says, that the Lord says, look, I'll make you insignificant among nations. You will be deeply despised. So he said, I'm, I'm going to, you know, as repayment for making fun of my people and kicking them while they're down and pillaging their country, I'm going to punish you by making you deeply despised by other nations. Your arrogant heart has deceived you. And you know, that happens to us, doesn't it? When we are full of arrogance and we think we know what's right and we don't see anything, we don't see any other viewpoints, we don't see any uh, way in which it could be different than the way we're thinking. We become very arrogant and we want to do things our way. Sometimes our arrogance even supersedes God's power in our lives and we think that we know more than God. And so we are arrogant and we have figured things out that even God himself doesn't know, or at least not telling me. So I just figured it out on my own. I didn't need God's help. And unfortunately, that's the way that many of us look at the world. We look at the world by what we can do and what we have done and the rewards that we should get because we are so wonderful. Uh, and that kind of um, transposes to the idea that other people who don't agree with us are other people who, um, who, who, are, who are, in quotes, enemies or that we know don't like them and we don't like them. We know that when something happens to them, that because of our arrogance, we feel like, good, we're glad that happened to you. And if we had the opportunity, we would kick you even more. And that's what the uh, people did, the Edomites did, and that's what God is addressing in this uh, in these particular verses. He says that your arrogant heart has deceived you. So even though you know you think that you know it all, you've been deceived by your arrogant heart. You who live in the clefts of the mountains, in in these situations, in these holes, in these caves that no one can get to you, you think that you're above reproach. It says, uh, you who live in the clefts of the rock in your homes on the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring me to the ground? And and he and goes on to say, though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there, I will bring you down. That's the Lord's declaration. So we say to ourselves, well, Lord, you know, we are so high and mighty. We've done so well and we've done all this on our own. We didn't need your help. We did it. And look how great we are. And these people who went against us, they've been defeated and we're going to go down and ramshackle what's left and loot what's left and we're going to you know bring up bring all that home and make a big issue uh you, you know out of it as we make fun and mock the people the israelites who were destroyed and um and god said no that that's not the way that it's going to be you're going to be thrown down they say who can throw us down and god simply says i can i can throw you down i can take your wings clip your wings even though you soar like eagles Okay, so, so so then uh, the the next section, uh, verse ten, it says, "You will be covered with shame and destroyed forever, because of violence done to your brother Jacob." 
So he's telling the Edomites that they're going to always have trouble from now on. They're never going to really get it all together again, and they haven't. On the day you stood aloof, on the day strangers captured his wealth, while foreigners entered his city gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were just like one of them. So he's talking about the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem when they came and destroyed Judah, the, the, the uh, two southern kingdoms. The ten northern kingdoms had already been destroyed, and now the two southern kingdoms get destroyed, and they carry off people into captivity. It was during this time that Ezekiel was carried off into a captivity as well as Daniel. Um, but anyway, the point here is that the Edomites are glad. They're happy that this is happening instead of feeling um, sorrowful for the people. And instead of wanting to help them, they uh, you know, are caught up in themselves and the way they think. And it's contrary to the way these people think. And so why help them? And so we go into our lives today and we see to ourselves sometimes that if somebody gets that promotion at work and they gloat about it and they're happy about it and they carry on. And then about four weeks later, you find out that they're in a scandal and they lose that job. Well, we couldn't be happier. Or somebody wins the lottery and they're all, they're all happy and everything. And I remember on TV, they had a um, program and it talked about what happened to the people who won the lottery. And in, in many, many cases, they lost it all. You know, they took it, the money that they had, and they would uh, they'd just go out and squander it. They would give some away. They would buy all these things. They couldn't, re you know, you know they, they'd get the things that were over their head and maintaining them, and they finally had to give it all up. Now, not all of them, but a lot of them did. And as people sat there and watched that, they thought, well, good, you won the lottery, and you had the, these hundreds of thousands of dollars, and, and that now you've squandered it and you've lost it. So I'm glad, you know, I'm glad that happened to you. You didn't deserve to win anyway. Shouldn't be playing the lottery. So some of us have that in our hearts. You know, we feel that way. Somebody who does well, we, you know, kind of deep down, we hope they do bad. But Jesus, you know, he certainly didn't preach that, did he? He said, uh, lo love your neighbor, but also love your enemy. And when they do something wrong to you, turn the other cheek because you don't want to continue on the these uh, this fight and this uh, hard feelings and the feuding that may go on for weeks and months. Sometimes it takes the Christian to make the decision not to fight back and to turn the other cheek. And so it is just the opposite here. Um, and, and in verse 10 and 11, it, it says, uh, God tells them, or Obadiah tells them what God says, that you'll be covered with your shame. And on the day you stood aloof, on the day strangers captured his wealth, while foreigners entered his city gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were just like one of them. So when the Babylonians came in and they overtook the, the city and looted it and everything, you were all happy about it. You went down and you watched like spectators and you were glad that all this happened. He says, do not gloat over your brother in the day of his calamity. So see, he talks about his brother because this was Esau and Jacob. So he was his brother. In the day of his calamity, do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction. Do not boastfully mock in the day of distress. Like I say, unfortunately, we do too much of that in our lives today. We want people who are doing well to, to, to fall. You have a big CEOs that have all the wealth and all the money and everything. And then we find or we read in the paper that, uh, you know, they, something happened and they lost a bunch of it. Or they found out that they were doing things that were illegal and they've taken them to court. And they've taken back a lot of their money. There was uh, in, in the news and she's been in the news for a couple of years because they're just going through the trials and all about the lady that owned a um, blood company and they would do tests on blood that people had. And she was falsifying a lot of the information, making it look like it was a lot better. Her product was a lot better than what it was. And when they found out, they, they saw that millions of people had been uh, taken advantage of. And when that happened, the stock, her stock bro broke and fell and, and uh, people lost millions, you know, who had stock in her company. And so when this happened, you know, they t took her to court, so she's got to pay it back. But you think, you know, you know, what, what a, uh, you know, you know, total, um, you know, just, just a dishonest person who does not care about anything else but money. They do not care about people. They will do anything they can to get from them, to take from them. And so in your heart, you kind of think, well, good, she deserved that. I'm glad they caught her and I'm glad she's paying the penalty. Uh, do you remember Madoff when he, uh, he, you know, ripped people off for millions of dollars and, they finally caught him and put him in jail and people rejoiced at that. They said, good, we're glad that you're in jail. We're glad that you went to jail because you deserve to go there. Not only that, we hope you die and rot there. 
Uh, and it's because of all these people that he was dishonest with and their inheritances they lost. And they were going to live in a life of poverty now instead of a life of of good and plenty like they were promised. And, and I, you know, you can see those feelings, why people would feel that way. I mean, I, that didn't happen to me, but it's hard telling how I would feel. With God's grace, I wouldn't be like the Edomites and look down upon him and hope that he gets killed or beat up in jail or whatever it is. But I would want, you know, still want to help him and be a part of his life if I was able to be, if I could help him and bring him aid. Uh, so it says, do not gloat over your brother in the day of his calamity. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction. Do not boastfully mock in the day of distress. Do not enter my people's city gate in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their misery in the day of their disaster and do not appropriate their possessions in the day of their disaster. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off their fugitives and do not hand over their survivors in the day of distress. So, so they're, they're saying, you know, that, that not, not only did you go down and look at the destruction and loot and plunder, but the survivors that were escaping, you helped capture them and turn them over to the enemy. And so you, these things that you've done to your brother are despicable and you're going to pay the price for it. You're going to be thrown out of your caves, cast down, and you're going to no longer soar like eagles because the punishment of the Lord is coming upon you. Now you notice that in this we also see the the punishment of of uh, God upon Israel. So you know Israel they were punished too for the way that they acted in their um, in their apostasy, their turning away from God and worshiping idols. You know, they they had pay the price too. They were immune to that. And so Obadiah is saying, "But you people who have turned against God and turned against your brother, you're going to really pay the price." Um, it said, uh, in, it says here that the Edomites will be covered with their shame and, uh, they will, and the Edomites will be, be destroyed forever. This, this covered with your shame, sometime the, whenever the shame comes up in the Old Testament, it's talking about God's punishment. And we've talked about that somewhat. So we've, we've I think, looked, looked at that pretty well. So let's move on to the next section here. Obadiah 15 through 17. It said, for the day of the Lord is near. Now, the day of the Lord, that's used in several contexts in the Old Testament. The day of the Lord could mean the day that Israel's punished for their sins. Judah and Israel, when they're, they're punished for their sins, the day of the Lord. Uh, it could mean the day of the Lord when they are actually delivered from captivity or delivered from their oppression. It could be when the Lord returns again, the day of the Lord when God returns and bring his people unto them. And so it had several different meanings, this day of the Lord. It, it could mean the day of the Lord is when their, their enemies were punished as well. And so it was kind of used interchangeably. It really wasn't used too much about God coming again, returning until later on in the Old Testament when they were kind of getting that idea about God returning and setting up a kingdom on this earth. It really wasn't until, you know, more, more of the New Testament idea. But, but, but anyway, the day of the Lord, that, that was a term that was used for God's punishment and judgment upon nations in general. That's what it meant. Rather, it meant to punish Israel, to punish Israel's uh, enemy, or to bring Israel from their depression and from their defeat. Uh, it, it was always, you know, this term was always interchangeable. And so Obadiah is using this term here, and he's saying, for the day of the Lord is near against all nations. So here, the day of the Lord is God's um, punishment toward all nations and, and, and their punishment for what they did. As you have done, it will be done to you. What you deserve will return on your own head. As you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and gulp down and be as though they had never been. But there will be a deliverance on Mount Zion, and it will be holy. The house of Jacob will dispossess those who dispossess them. So Obadiah kind of sums up his letter here, his book, by telling the people what's going to happen to them. It's kind of a general overall curse upon all the nations that have gone against Israel. 
not only did was not only did God place his hand of judgment on Israel but also on the nations especially that fought against and went against Israel and then in this particular case the Edomites who gloated for them and as, as I've said the Edomites they weren't just a nation in the area they were Israel's brother they should they had the same blood it, you know basically they had the same blood that came from the Israelites half of half they were half brothers half sisters and so they should have shown them some some forgiveness and some sympathy and some help as things like this went on. But instead of doing that, they actually fought against them at times with other nations. They would join, make an alliance with another nation, and they would attack Judah or Israel. And so they certainly were not, you know, seen as, as blood brothers or blood people, uh, even though they actually were. Okay. Um, so, so what we're what we're looking at here, if we kind of sum sum these things up, is that the sin of indifference leads to violence and oppression. Now, um, a lot of times, sin that we have it doesn't really show itself at that particular time, but it shows itself in the actions that occur after it. For instance, we're indifferent towards this individual, or we're indifferent toward that situation. And because we are, our heart becomes hardened and individuals who are in those circumstances never re really ever receive our help because we are indifferent to the situation. We don't care about them. And instead of doing what God has called us to do, and that is to care for all people, we turn our eyes upon ourselves and we do what's best only for us. And that's unfortunate, but that's the way things go. Another thing is, it says, we, we, uh, we are to have compassion to those who are helpless and cannot defend themselves. So, you know, you look around, even in our nation, uh, who are the ones that are downtrodden, kicked and down? Those are the ones that we need to help. Well, exactly what does that mean? Well, it's really hard to say. I mean, how many people who are standing out on the corner wanting money and wanting this, wanting that, how many of them are really in need? Or how many of them are taking advantage of you know, a disability or something when there's nothing wrong with them or when they could be working, but instead they're, they're standing out, the, out there, you know, just wanting a handout. Uh, so so do you help them or, or not? If there's somebody on the side of the road, you know, do you help them or, or do you not help them? Um, if if you, you know, you know, look out and you see people who are hungry and going to a soup kitchen, do you help provide food for them? Or do you think that providing food for them will make things even worse for them in their life? Uh, you know, how do you vote? Do you vote for certain programs, for certain policies that in general help people or make people help themselves? Um, and, and, and how do we know one from the other? Well, you know, you really don't, do you? And so I would say my advice is just to err on the side of good. Remember when Jesus was walking around, he didn't help just the poor or just the rich or just the intelligent or just the unintelligent or just a Jew, or just a Gentile, or just a man, or just a woman, or just a sin, sinless, or just a sinful. Uh, he helped everyone. Anybody who needed help and approached him and asked for help, he gave it to them. Now, he gave it to them in different ways. Everybody doesn't need the same kind of help, but he was open, and he listened, and he did what his Father in heaven told him to do. So let me just say that if you uh, are having trouble trying to discern whether or not you are helping somebody and what you're doing, just ask God, ask him for his direction and the Holy Spirit, he will He will tell you what to do. I mean, that may seem kind of apple pie in the sky advice that I'm giving to you, but, but that really is true. Uh, at least it has been for me because there are many instances where you really don't know if helping somebody is really helping them or if it's just allowing the situation to get worse and worse. Uh, we don't know the people a lot of times, but I know whenever I've, I've you know, gone to um, serve dinner at like, uh, uh, at, at uh, was it Warm Blessings or places like that? Uh, you know, I treat everybody like they are deserving of a meal. And I treat everybody like a human being. You know, I don't just stand up there and give them their food and ignore them. I go sit at the table with them, talk to them. A lot of them are paranoid. They're afraid of me. Some of them are very friendly. 
uh, but it doesn't really matter. You know, I just do what I feel that I'm supposed to do. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I could say, no, I'm not going to help them. They need to get their own food. Uh, you know, they could do it if they wanted to. Uh, but I don't know if that's true or not because of mental problems and physical things that may have happened or whatever it may be. You know, you know I just don't know. And so I just pray and I go in and I help, help, do help. I, I help them. I talk to them. Uh, hopefully, you know, I, I build them up and, and then, and then that's just, you know, some of my help and that's a positive and some I don't, and that's a negative. You just do what you can do and hope that, 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 you know, you're helping more than you're not. And the Holy Spirit will tell you that he'll show you that. And I think sometimes he gives you the words to say when you're talking to uh, individuals like that, instead of being, you know, haughty and and, and and saying, well, you know, why don't they do this or that? You know, they can do this or that. And in many cases, that's exactly right. Many people can get jobs that are on uh, welfare or that are on disability. Many of them can. You know, I'm not saying they can't. Somebody's on the side of the road that's broken down. They have an old car. Well, that's their problem. They shouldn't be driving junk like that around. They should get a better car. You know, that's, you know, you know we can, we can say that. But the point is, God doesn't want us to act that way. He wants us to help in any circumstance or any situation which we might, which we may without judgment. God will take care of the rest. The story of the Good Samaritan. The guy comes along and sees somebody beat up on the road. Uh, what what would you think of might happen? Well, that's a setup. If I get out there and help him, then somebody's going to attack me and take the money that I have. And yet this guy, he stopped and he went and he helped him. He didn't know if helping was going to help or not. He took him to the next town, and not only did he, uh, well, first of all, he took care of his wounds and everything, bandaged him, then he took him to the town and, and took him to a motel or an inn, and he said, I'm going to pay for this man's room and board, uh, plus I'm going to pay for anything else that he may owe later. Now, this good Samaritan who helped, he didn't question what was going on. He didn't say, um, maybe I shouldn't help him. Uh, he may have asked that. Uh, maybe I shouldn't help him because maybe it is a setup. Uh, what's this guy doing traveling on this road by himself? That was a stupid thing to do, a bad decision. He deserves what he gets. I don't have time to mess with him. I've got other things to do. We can come up with all kinds of of, uh, of uh, reasons why we don't help, all kinds of excuses. Some of them are judgmental and some are not. And so the point is, err on the side of doing the right thing. Help them. Just stop them, help them. And if, if um, you know, if, if, if you did bad out of your generosity, then that's not on you. You've done what you feel God wants you to do, what Jesus taught you to do. You can't just turn a blind eye and just look away from everything that's going on. Now, there are some circumstances where you know, you know, that, that helping is going to be a problem or a difficulty and it's going to, uh, uh, you know, cause it's it's not going to help the situation or especially in the long term so there are there are times when you know maybe it's best not to help i don't know what those times are i don't know sometimes uh, you know when it's best to help them but i know when i was pastor of the church if anybody came through and needed uh, you know something to pay for their rent or to pay for food or uh, this or that and they would start giving me these these excuses i would just stop them i'd say look i uh the help I'm going to give you is not based on on your excuses or on what happened to you. It's simply based on the love of Jesus Christ, period. Uh, and I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to help you. I don't want a big, long uh, speech on why you need it or, or, this, this, or you know, this, this or that. You've come to me. Uh, you, you've asked for help. Uh, so here it is. And, and you know, I, I give to them whatever it was. I put them up in a motel or whatever it may be. Uh, I may have not done the right thing at times, but, you know, that's not on me. I do what the Lord called me to do, and that is to reach out in compassion and to help those who are in need. Um, I mean, let's face it, people who come and ask for help, they're in need. You know, they're, they're not going to just go around duping everybody, uh, you know, and live in poverty. That's not a good life in which to live, and that's not their choice, I doubt, in most cases. And if it is, then I've helped them a little bit, make that that road that they chose a little easier to follow, to walk. Uh, so anyway, that's, you know, that's up to you and your Lord on who you help and why you help them and what have you. But God is telling us, Obadiah is telling us 
that when people are, you know, run into misfortunes and difficulties occur in their life, that we're not to turn our backs on them and to scoff at them, but we're to love them and do what it is that he calls us to do to take care of them. Okay, so let's go ahead then and, and close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for Obadiah and for his prophecies and for these messages as he proclaimed and preached to the people. We pray, Lord, for opportunities to help and to serve and the discernment to know what the best thing to do is according to your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.